Uh, welcome to the Areas and Mets and District Association's What If Bushfire Scenario webinar. My name is Charlotte Allen and I'm the President of ADA. I would first like to acknowledge that we're meeting on the lands of the traditional owners of our country. I'm in Melbourne on, on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. In September, Ada with the Friends of Lawn presented in presenting the very successful series Fire Unplanned, What's the Future of Living in a Fire Prone Region? One of the key messages from that series was that change is our new normal and that we will need to become expert at planning and managing change. The question is though, just how do we do that? One of the findings of the recent Bushfire Royal Commissions is that locally led response and community self-reliance is key to resilience. Local scenario planning is a critical tool for that preparedness. Tonight, we have one of Victoria's expert bushfire and emergency response specialists, Jamie McKenzie, who will focus on practical, prepared, local strategic response. Jamie has over 35 years experience in operational roles for bushfire and emergency response and has worked as a senior instructor in bushfire and leadership development with the CFA. Jamie will go through the scenario of a bushfire breaking out behind Aries Inlet and introduce agency staff from Forest Fire Management, Vicpole, Parks Victoria and Surf Coast Shire who will outline their roles and contingency plans in the event of a fire. The scenario itself will take about 45 minutes and there will be ample time for questions afterwards. You will learn about evacuation and traffic management planning, as well as what you, as a community member, can do. And there's a lot. As Jamie says, all the expertise required during a bushfire is already in the community. Please use the chat button to submit your questions at any time during the scenario, and Nick Guyatt from Surf Coast Shire will direct them to the appropriate person to answer once the scenario is finished. If there are several questions on the same topic, they will be grouped for answering. If your answer is not, not answered today, someone will get back to you later with a response. This session is being recorded and will be available on YouTube via a link on Ada's website. Bushfire is an issue for the whole community and looking through the registration list, I was very pleased to see that we have a lot of people who are not Ada members. Welcome. If any one of you would like to join Ada, information about joining is also on the website. Jamie, welcome and over to you. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, sorry, the dogs were just barking. I just hope no one can hear that. Um, look, welcome everybody. Um, tonight's probably going to raise more questions than answers, and that's probably not a bad thing. Um, I, I imagine most people tonight um, have a plan um, for bushfire. There's been enough, um, enough going on and planning over many, many years, particularly living in the, the area that we live. Um, people will have a bushfire plan. Tonight's really aimed at improving that plan and, and preparing you for, for a whole lot of different scenarios that you probably haven't considered for your plan. Um, so what I'm saying is you most of you will have a plan and, and um, depending on your plan, but I would probably start off by saying most of your plans probably won't work. And by that I mean, there'll be things thrown up that just you just can't plan for when you're sitting in, uh, in a room thinking about it. And tonight we're just hoping to fill a few gaps with that uh, through the use of a scenario. Now, the most stressful part of tonight is actually seeing if this the technology will work. So I'm gonna share the screen now and we'll work through the scenario, but I must admit, I, this is the part that probably freaks me out the most. So stay tuned, we hope to get this. Uh, Jesus, where are we? Oh. <laughs> Show all windows, there we go. Whew. Now, can I just check in with, um, are we all seeing, 
just one screen as a slideshow, please. Looks good. That's okay. Thank you. Whew. Okay. Um, so now we're just going to look at, so what's your plan? So what's the plan? And tonight we're going to involve the agencies as well, just so you understand what's going on and probably just overlay some reality to it all. Um, just so again, when you go back to revisit your plan, which I hope you do at the end of this, um, that will actually make the plan and understand what, what the agencies are trying to do, uh, what people in the community may be able to do and some takeaways that, again, as uh, Charlotte said, all, all the skills needed to deal with um, what, you'll, what you'll face are already in the community. Um, so it's just making use of those. So what's the plan, Aries Inlet? So Aries Inlet summer, so I might um, go to a local. Peter, tell us a little bit Aries in summer. Oh, thanks, Jamie. Yes, I've, I've had about 60 summers in Aries Inlet. And uh, these days, on a, a good day in summer, you're looking at about 8,000 people uh, in Aries Inlet, quite apart from the many thousands of people who are on the road. And I think the key word to say about Aries in summer is uh, dispersal. That's to say it's quite a dispersed community with uh, sections of the community up around the top shops and the lighthouse precinct down uh, around the bottom shops, Fairhaven and so on. And similarly, people are very dispersed in terms of where they are on the beach. So that while the biggest uh, crowd would be at, uh, at Fairhaven, uh, there'd be probably 500 people there. There are going to be other groups of people on the, uh, the main beach at Aries, uh, at Sandy Gully, at Steppy Beach, at various places. So on a hot day in summer, you're talking about quite a, uh, a significant population, but quite dispersed uh, between Fairhaven and beyond all the way through to the top shops. Um, what about the traffic as we go through summer? <laughs> and living well, in, East, know exactly in, in summer, like. we're talking about, um, you know, around 10,000 vehicles a day, um, at least. So it's the roads are very crowded. And, and of course, one of the things that makes people who are watching this um, presentation this evening most anxious is uh, what's going to be happening on the roads because people will be anticipating whether it's time to leave Aries, uh, but they'll be very conscious of the fact that there's an awful lot of traffic uh, from people further down the coast who are moving backwards and forwards as well. So that's a, a significant issue. Yeah, thanks, Peter. The, um, and you're right, you know, and it, and it can be affected by events like the, you know, the Pier to Pub at Lawn with extra traffic and affect with a, with a market at Anglesey. And of course, we've got the roundabout that solved all the problems, but every now and then <laughs> that does. Um, think so, but also we have these people who, and I, a lot of the time we, we, we're always sort of going on, you know, how do we get to them? How do they get to understand? And in their mindset, they're not coming to a high risk area, they're coming to the beach. Um, so that's their thinking. They're not thinking of going into a bushfire area. They're thinking of going, coming down to the beach. Um, they're not in the Grampians or one of those places. So there's a little bit of a different mindset. And I also think too, at any given point in time, all those visitors and tourists are part of our communities at that point in time. Um, so as we move, so on that day, we were sort of looking at, I hope no one can hear those dogs. Jeez. Um, on, <laughs> Murphy's Law. Um, but on those days, on a day like we had the, the temperature, you know, where it's, a, it's warm, it's a severe day, um, close to extreme. And it's one of those days, almost like um, some of the bad days we have, where it starts off not too bad. Um, so we've got the, the, the market happening. It's that middle of the summer in the early January, uh, and we're at, at full peak. Now, at about 11 o'clock, a fire starts. So at this point in time, and I'll look at, Pete, I'll come back to you. How do we know about that? Meanwhile, you know, how do we actually know that there's a fire in the landscape at this point? You're going to have quite a number of people in Aries who've done the right things in terms of getting um, the SES emergency website on their phones. Yep. Uh, so there'll be some people who've already decided uh, it's high time, to, high time to leave. But there'll be other people, of course, who are just aware that there's a bit of menacing smoke in the air. Uh, and they'll be wondering what the hell's going on. And, and for the first bit of time, um, there'll be a notification of the fire report, which will come through on the um, emergency VIC app. 
Um, but we still don't know. There's no been no eyes on the fire at this stage. So no local responders have actually got to the fire yet. So at this stage, it could be a campfire in the middle of a, a quarry, for all we know. Um, so no one actually knows the risk this fire poses yet. We have some indicators, of course, with the weather. But at this point in time, um, have a consider, is that a trigger to leave? Now, as you said, some will. How many people are looking at the app? And it sort of depends where everybody also is at that point in time. So people, the family will probably be dispersed. So at that time when that fire first thing comes through on an app, are people actually looking at their phones? Some will. Um, where are the family members? Are they all together? I, my experience with my kids, and that is we don't hover around in summer as a family unit going everywhere. So we could have some kids down the beach, some kids at a friend's place. We could have one parent at the shops, one parent in Bunnings, one parent anywhere, someone playing golf. And at this stage, we've just got an indication that there's a fire in the landscape. So when we start to think is, so some of the things are, where are you now? Are you going to start gathering the family together? Imagine trying the, just the little things of how do you get your, you know how it is getting your kids out of the water at the beach. So imagine trying to, if they're out surfing, all those types of, of deals. So if your plan just assumes that the whole family's together to go and put whatever action in, that's fine. But let's look at the reality in summer on, on a day like that, where it's severe going to extreme. But of course, as the weather's getting hotter, you're, you're sort of in it. So you, you don't absolutely know for sure. You just might notice that wind's picking up. Um, so that's one thing to consider is where is everybody? And so now what? You've got an alert on your, your app, has gone off. Um, fire um, agencies are responding now. Um, by and large, a lot of people are just going about their business at this point in time. So 11 o'clock, there's a fire in the landscape. Where, are, where is everybody? Are you at the market? Um, out running? How do you get in contact with people? A few, you know, a little bit later, 15, 20 minutes later, you now see this at the back. You may notice it, of course, depending where you are. Uh, as again, the whole of the community doesn't just notice this immediately. You might get some more information. People, tell us what do you think so? You've just dropped out. Repeat that. Um, what do you think social media is happening at this point once a little bit of smoke's being seen on the landscape? Oh, social media is now starting to really hot up and um, people are getting becoming very anxious. Yep because uh, some of their friends are saying uh, you need to you need to get out of here or you where, where is everybody as you say Jamie yep. uh, where's the family uh, I told you so and so shouldn't have gone to the beach um, so people are starting to think this is maybe serious they're, they're, they're watching their phones quite anxiously at this point so people down the beach the visitors um, when they realize that they're at risk what's their probably their initial response going to be I think the people on the beach, particularly people who are um, a day trippers are going to think we've got to get on the road and get and head towards Geelong. Yep. Uh, and then they're going to think, gee, there are a lot of other people with the same idea. Uh, and there are going to be local people who are, as you say, concerned, how do we get in touch with everybody within the family? And also with all that traffic is actually the family connecting up. How do you actually move from parts within the town itself? So it's not just even the traffic though, it was just within the, within the town. Yes. So it's starting to develop. So we've got people dispersed, the family units may be together, but more than likely not. Um, we've got visitors with now smoke and, the, and with the social media. And of course, social media um, can be a good source of information, but it also can be a source of disinformation. Um, so that's all happening as well. Um, meanwhile, firefighters are probably heading out to the fire. And we were sort of doing some response. By the time we really got a good handle on particularly where the fire location is here, of course, those in Aries Inlet won't actually have a really a full understanding exactly where the fire is. Um, 
it'll be in the landscape. They'll see smoke and the smoke will be starting to build, particularly on a day like that. And if you look at the weather and the winds with that, they are now starting to throw up significant smoke. But we actually won't know exactly where the front of the fire is at this point. So when we start to look at what the community are doing, um, the agencies are responding. We'll talk a little bit about that. They're going to the fire. But of course, depending on the location and a location like you're seeing here, that's not something you drive up to. So we know that aircraft will be uh, responded. Um, so that, that's okay. But in that first hour, that's when a lot of the key decisions from responders take place. Because until we start to, to get some eyes on the fire and some good int intelligence, we don't actually know what we're dealing with. But meanwhile, back in the back in the township. Um, we have people trying to leave. And of course, the traffic might be flying okay if there's no accident, if there's no panic, if there's no, if everyone's orderly, if um, everyone's just moving around town calm. Um, but that's probably not gonna be the case. So what's your plan at this state? Stay where you are, get more information. If so, where? Um, enact your fire plan, do you have one? Um, and can you enact your plan? Uh, do you have all the, the pits? Are you able to do it? If the road's blocked, are you able to get out? Now, we can put roads in everywhere, but there's no easy, easy out. There's no guarantees. Um, so this is, this is the, the hard bit. Um, and under pressure and stress, we know that decision-making can collapse. And we'll, we'll, we'll be probably rushing things at this point. And if you go back to the, I'll just go back to that previous slide. That fire is still a little way out of town. Um, it's not going to be on the doorstep in five minutes. So one of the things is there's probably a little bit more time than we think. So that's probably one thing I'd probably consider. Um, and one of the good indicators is, is if you are in a position to see the column of smoke, is it building? Is it developing? Is it moving? All those sort of things. So start being a little bit more aware of the environment. Now, I know the messaging will, will start and will, and hopefully it will, but also in your plans, what happens if the towers go down? What happens if the internet goes down? Um, Murphy's Law, you know, if we're relying on technology to provide all the information, what happens when it fails? What's your plan B? Um, the firefighters who are on here have probably been involved with fire for many, 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 many years. And communication is one of the things that typically always fails at some point. Um, but we always seem surprised when it fails. So maybe, so the thinking now is, okay, let's, what do we do when, the, when we lose communication? What's the plan when we, when we can't communicate or the internet goes down or we lose the phone towers? What's our plan then? And if we start to think of some of those what ifs, that helps improve our plan. So two hours later, within two hours on these conditions, um, this is from the modeling, of course, but remember, you don't get to see this. You know, in Aries Inlet and Anglesey, you don't get to see this. All you're seeing is a smoke column on the landscape. And at this point in time in Aries Inlet, You've got spot fires two hours later, you've got spot fires within the town, but also think the column of smoke is now right over the town. So within that one to two hours, smoke is now laying down over the town, more than likely blocking out the sun. You'll have embers starting to fall and that's within two hours. So that's the decisional space you're in. Poor visibility, Spot fires starting within the township. You not actually know exactly where the fire front is. And um, you're breathing. Where, if your family's back together, hopefully. Um, and it's a little bit of a case of now what? As you imagine what the roads would be like at this point, hopefully there's no accident. And more than likely at, at this point in time, um, here we are. So we're going to right now. I don't. We'll, we'll, we'll tie, tidy this up. I don't want people to go. Oh my God! 
Um, we'll work through this systematically is what the agencies are planning because it's really important with our planning is to actually look at the realities. Um, if, we, if it's a known, we can plan for it. Um, and the more knowns we have and, and the more thinking we put into our planning, what actually happens is it, it actually, at that point in time, it speeds up our decision-making. And, and at the end of the day, um, when we're impacted like something like this, it's a decision-making exercise. What we're now involved in is decision-making. Um, and what we really want to hope from this is that we improve decision-making. So your checklists and plans, absolutely. But do they include these type of situations? Um, putting yourself emotionally, what it would be like not being able to breathe properly, um, your eyes watering and burning, um, smoke in the town, you actually don't know where things are. Visibility is really, really poor. Traffic, as you can imagine, um, traffic probably at a standstill. Uh, so do you stay in your car? And look, and these are questions we can't actually answer tonight. <laughs> it's like everyone, every situation is differently. What we need you to think about is the what ifs. So when you are looking at your plans, start to factor in some of the what ifs. So checklists and plans are good to a point, but as you know, we can't actually write a plan for every situation we're gonna confront. Now, that's just the reality of everything. That's, you know, all the best plans, dynamic risk assessments, all the best plans when confronted with the reality um, may work to a point, but we've gotta be able to be adapt and, and change and, and innovate. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So the response says, so let's get up now and, and just, just so you know what the agencies are doing. So this is how, if you like, a structure, a response structure will form. The fire, um, everything will be coordinated um, through the local command facility at Anglesey, which is the Parks Victoria office. And in that local command facility will be um, representatives from Forest Fire Management and Parks, CFA, Vic Pole, maybe depends on the numbers, different people with the coordination. They will link to an incident control center for, a, for our footprint here, that'll be in Geelong. Now that'll be an incident management team, which is you know, thinking strategically, big picture. They'll also then link into the regional control center. This is about getting resources, response type of things, messaging, modeling and what's going on. Um, and then that connects to the state. From the local command facility, they'll also, they'll be coordinating with the firefight, but also there'll be a coordination with the township. So while there'll be responders at the fire, there'll be responders uh, in the township as well. So that's, if you like, the structure that'll set up. So what I'll do now is I'm just going to um, bring on representatives from the agency. Um, we've got Aaron Ritchie's here now. Uh, and I'm just going to ask Aaron just a little bit about some of the resourcing that, that Vic Pole will have on a day like today uh, and that we could expect in summer. Aaron, have I got you there? Yes, Jamie, thank you. Um, so Aaron, on a day like this, um, what sort of numbers staffing have you got along the, along the coast on a typical summer's day? There would be three divisional vans or uh, PSA-based patrol units and a supervisor, a sergeant, and that would most likely be it. So that would, that would be a total of four units and the sergeant would have linked up with the person in control at the fire to get pertinent information and feed that back to command, uh, we would have already been started a, a range of planning and uh, back at Geelong, it included a resource plan, the traffic management plan, we would already be giving thought to evacuation and feeding off the incident control and our stakeholders. So Aaron, in a situation like that where we have spot fire and smoke and everything in the town, would, would evacuation be likely? I wouldn't think you'd have time to evacuate. And as you've already said, the roads would be absolutely chaos. 
and potentially at a standstill, and we would hate to have people caught in cars when the fire front came through. Yeah, and, and, and you're right. Like, you know, you, you think of the road between Aries, right through to Urquhart's Bluff and back into Anglesey. Um, and also, Aaron, the, the four police we have, I think that's hopefully there's nothing else they're attending at that time either. Yeah, that's correct. The business as usual uh, implications need to be considered. Having said that, we would have swung on very early to a significant resource plan, and that would be drawing on resources from the Geelong and Colac areas. And if it exceeds those, uh, you know, the, our span of control and what we need, well, then we would elevate that up through our Remy, Dean Howard, who's on, and get resources from outside the division for a protracted incident. Yeah. So, yeah. So for that, for that, so helps on its way, um, but it'll be a little bit time. And at the moment, with that short time span, with the when you have the spot fires and um, fire into the town, it's probably too late to evacuate. Absolutely. So we would have put uh, TMPs or traffic management points in place to stop, probably way back at Geelong to stop yep. traffic going into the affected area, yep. and we'd be looking at managing the the cars trying to come out of the area. Having said that, we, we all know that if the view is that there's the fire's an hour away, the fire's probably only 20 minutes to half an hour away, and, that's, and that would be our thinking. We don't have time. Great. Thanks, Aaron. Look, um, uh, I'll flick now to um, Aaron Ledden um, from Forest Fire Management Parks, who, um, who typically on a day like today, Aaron, you, where would you be? Yeah, evening, Jamie. Yeah, I'd probably be set up at the LCF as one of the divisional commanders. So on a day like that, um, as you said, we, we do set up agency blind. So we, we set up with CFA and we, we liaise with local uh, Vic Poles, such as John and Aaron in the morning and, and work through our game plan for the day. But my role would be to to lead the LCF and, and to help coordinate the fire response on the ground of both forest fire management and, and very closely with, with CFA resources as well. So in an instance like that you've shown today with a fire starting at the back, um, from a forest fire management perspective, like on a, a day like that, we would actually have a number of heavy plant on standby or, or on call to respond. There'd be aircraft and locally out of the Anglesey office, um, we'd have anything up to 20 to 30 staff in fire, firefighting appliances that we would roll out to a job like that. Um, but saying that too, at the same time, Jamie, the conversations between the agencies are around that, that rapid assessment of, are we gonna get this in first attack? And if we're not, um, our priority then is actually switching those resources back into community around how do we structure up around um, providing support back into Aries or, or Anglesey. It's, um, we, we do make those rapid decisions around um, whether we're going to be successful in that, that when we take first attack and that's that getting on top of a fire early. And, and if we don't think we can, then, then we'll look at what, what is it we need to do for community. And so that's potentially falling back into um, uh, either asset protection or community protection back in town. So, um, so also, but on a, just just so um, community members know, so on a on the readiness sort of stuff before you know at the start of the day, what's sort of in place from the agencies as far oh. as you know, resourcing and uh, patrols and things like that? Yeah, it's, it's, sorry, Jane, I probably missed the mark on the question. So leading into a, a total fire band day, so that which that day would be. Say the night before, we would actually have we have enforcement staff and a number of staff that go out and patrol the bush the night before, looking for those informal campsites and camp where people informally camp through the landscape. Plus, we visit all our own our known visitor nodes and, and talk to campers about the day ahead and, and try and get people out of the bush the day before. Um, on the day of um, a similar, if it was a total fire band day like that. Um, we actually structure up around um, early starters. So we have crews start early in the morning to get them out in the bush. And we have set patrol um, through the landscape where we've got staff out patrolling the landscape, visiting all the known formal, informal camp areas to try and detect, um, say, fire in the landscape, but also to get a handle on who is out in the park and more 
broader uh, in the in the landscape, but also to part of that uh, rationale is actually having firefighting resources, not just stored at a depot in a town, but actually we try and get a good spread of our, our first response vehicles through the broader landscape so that if we do get a start up, um, we try and get vehicles there as quickly as we can and, and staff there as quickly again as we can to help with that early size up of a fire or or in some t- in some cases if we if we can get there quick enough it's it's trying to get on top of these these jobs early so um, from early in the morning we, we're in the landscape and we're patrolling um, and all that information we feed back into the the local uh, feeds into the LCF but we also feed that up into the ICC in Geelong and also the ICC in Colac, which supports our footprint as well. So um, there's a constant information flow between the ground through the LCF back into the ICCs that that all help with that decision making later on. And uh, so things like during the day, beach traffic, um, how many people are at beaches, what's the traffic load like, what's the key visitor nodes, how busy are they? All that information is constantly being fed up into the ICC, which all then helps aid with decision making on the day. Thanks, mate. Um, so, so the, the initial response typically will be a combination with with forest fire management and parks. But meanwhile, back in the township, um, I'm going to get Ross Gervin, um, the coastal group officer and long term uh, angles. Uh, sorry, ang- ang- sorry, it's Anglesey West. I mean, sorry, Aries Inlet. Um, Ross Gervin, um, Anglesey Aries Inlet Fire Brigade member, just to tell us what's going on in the, the brigade doing at this stage, uh, Ross. Yeah, thanks, uh, Jamie. Um, if, look, firstly, um, from a group perspective, we're, we've done some um, sound work prior to this day. So uh, the day before, we've got a, a really clear indication of uh, the resources that we have available along the coast from a CFA perspective, and that's around manning uh, vehicles and 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 uh, who can fill in the key roles as uh, uh, you know fire leaders um, we feed that information into into delp and into the district so we're all quite clear on on the availability of local resources um, so f- on the, on a day like today the the expectations from our brigade we've got four vehicles most people would know uh, we'd be doing our best to to uh, have those four vehicles crewed and um, uh, typically uh, d- depending on workloads uh, many of the members would would come up to the station so for myself I'd either be at the uh, at, with Aaron at the Anglesey uh, local c- command facility or back at uh, the station um, to fulfill a role as a sector commander. So, so Ross what sort of numbers are we talking with firefight local firefighters in town yeah, look, it's 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 going to vary. So it, it could be um, you know fifteen to twenty, twenty five. It's really going to depend on on the, you know where people are working, whether they've got work locally. Um, it's that's the that that's the same with all the volunteer um, organisations. It's work related. Um, yeah. So when we start to do the math, you know, as Peter said earlier, eight thousand people and. Aaron said 30 to 40, maybe with the with the Delp and yourself with 15, 20, some Anglesey. So when you're starting to look, maybe 60 odd firefighters available to 8,000 people. Yeah, yeah. If we do <laughs> just the math, that's not how it rolls. But so when we start to look at a community and you know where do people gather? Where do we know that people will gather? Um, you know the the top shops the pub area, um, the river mouth, you know, the Fairhaven, and of course you've got the, the mogs and that, and again, that where the fire is in the landscape. So that the number of communities, and of course now if we go back to the scenario where more than likely that road will be blocked somehow, so people won't be getting out. So now we have people in the town. They've got smoke over it. Um, we've got limited resources. Probably the resources that we have is what we have. Um, as Aaron said, if the firefighters can get back out of the bush, back into town to, to do that. That will be of assistance. And the fire brigade and maybe some of the local brigades, if they've managed to get in in that first hour or so, will be there to try and um, manage and look after the people. Now, so it gets down to, this is the, 
the bit I think the reality reality check at this point in time, when no one's coming in, no one's going out for the next couple of hours because um, we can't do it safely. Um, there may be some options to the um, to lawn, but again, that takes coordination and people and how that doing that may get may happen. But a lot of things got to to go go well, and a lot of uh, and there's got to be a lot of luck. Now, plans based on luck um, usually aren't really good plans. So when we look at these things, I'd like to let's break it down into the first two to three hours. Um, the chaos is almost before the cavalry can get in, before anyone can get, get to us. Now, it's the same along the coast, Anglesey, Aries, Lawn, um, Y River, one road in and out, having extra roads when you're going back into the bush, which aren't a safe egress. Um, here we, it's going to come to a point where here we all are. Um, and in the first hour or so of any disaster or crisis, it's the actions of the first responders in the local community that will have the greatest impact on future outcomes. And we see it time and time again, people will step up. Also within the community, as I said at the start, a lot of the skills that we have are already in the community. And at this point in time, it's going to be miserable. This ain't about a pleasant day sitting in here, someone has just shot. This is going to be the worst day of everyone's lives. There's going to be smoke and ash. There's going to be burning embers falling on people. There's going to be fire in the town. You won't see. Houses will be could be alight. Um, but there are places we know people where, and you know, at the beach. This is now a place of making sure that we don't lose anybody. Um, Expectations of uh, our routine emergency management at this point in time just can't transfer. Um, radio communications, as you can imagine, will be frantic. Um, the vehicles trying to get information back. Um, there are things in, in play, and we've you know doing some of these response plans. But you can imagine, that, you know, even if we got two thousand out, we've still got six thousand in in the area. Um, so. Some of the response principles, and this is not just stuff made up. This is what tends to happen in disasters. At any time, at any point in the community, there are, you know, we've got responders on holidays who may be down there. We have the Surf Lifesaving Club as an emergency service. So we have first aiders. We have people with skills already in the community. We've got to think about the areas, low fuel areas. The neighbourhood safer places, as, as you could see, um, will only take so many people. Are you able to drive there? More than likely not. The road's going to be blocked. Um, how do you get to these places? This is what your plans are going to include. It may be you get on a bike and ride there. I, I, I don't know. So we, what happens in these, in these sort of times when we're going to be local responders and the community all in it together? Um, there'll be hastily formed networks that'll, that'll connect spontaneous volunteers and it can be it could be simply there's a group forming themselves up at the at the Aries pub another group at, at the Fairhaven who are starting to look out for people sort of connected if they can there'll be collaboration by not we won't have time to go back up to Geelong to ask for anything at, the, at this point in time although attempts will be made because by the time we get answers and coming back the situation will have changed so the, the collaboration will be between local responders on the ground with community, key community members. We'll be probably calling on people to step up. People will step forward as in every disaster. Burke Street, the Boston bombings, all these people, the first responders were local community members helping each other. Your neighbours. At this point in time, when we start to think about planning, it's think about your own personal and your family safety. Then if you've got that sorted, Look to your neighbour, because neighbours helping neighbours is, is, is what's going to make the probably the most biggest difference in what happens. Neighbours looking out for each other. Know your neighbours, even if they're visitors. Work out how you can connect with them. And then coordinating by aligning core efforts of getting people, treating them, whatever. In any disaster, when you distill it right down of what needs to happen, is we need to look after the safety and welfare of people. And that means, you know, first aid, shelter, safety, hydration, all those types of deals. We need to try and keep them calm as best we can. 
and we need to keep them informed as best we can. Now, it won't be really good information, but it'll be some information. So that's really the job that we've all got at this point in time, looking out for each other and the welfare and the safety, um, making sure we, we can communicate and connect and we've got some information and trying to keep people calm and considered in their decisions uh, and movements. Um, and it's not gonna be easy. Um, how we do that, we're just gonna have to be innovative. So this is, in these situations, and, and again, we're talking for the first couple of hours because meanwhile, efforts are being made, aircraft are coming, resources are being gathered, everything's starting to, to thing, waiting for the opportunity. As soon as they can get access into support, they will be there. So for that first little bit, we've just, if you like, trying to get ourselves through this first bit. Um, so we need to think differently. Now, this is... A, and the sort of thinking needed, and I'll, I'll use this example, that vending machine there. If you can all see the vending machine. The task I'm giving you is in quickly, how, if you had a group of people together at that vending machine, how do you get food or drink out of that vending machine with no money, no access to, access to money? Now, typically you push it over, you can smash it, that, but you know, if it's more sturdy and you can't do that, with a group of people, you'd try different things. Try that, it's got something you can program. Well, let's try, someone might have the skills to do that. So each idea builds on the next idea till you actually get something that works. So you try to work out, understand what's going on, the, the awareness of what's happening, the situation that you're confronting. Then you go, how are we gonna deal with this design? So this is, let's try that. Now that didn't work. How do we keep people cool? Let's try that. What if we try that and we keep building on the ideas until we find something that works? Once we find that answer, we put it into practice with a unified execution of it. We get together and to make it happen. But that's the type of thinking needed in these situations. We need rapid innovation, prototyping, trying it. No, oh, it didn't work. We learned from it. Try that. That works until we get some solution to whatever little problem that we're trying to solve. And the response agencies won't have all the answers. That's why we're all in this together now as, as community responders. So it's a community-based approach. We build on our combined strengths. We use local knowledge. We um, identify our stresses and shocks. We develop goals and solutions. We continue to learn and share and improve, connect people and networks. So it's those networks and relationships that are made and formed before the event that'll come into play at the most important time when we're, we're in it. Once you're, in that, once you're in that sort of environment, that isn't the time to ask for business cards and introduce yourselves. That's where we need to, to do that beforehand. So we get ourselves through this bit. We, we and you know, studies have shown that people being involved and helping and stuff like that, the recovery is, is better rather than being victims is using the skills that we have, even if it's checking on people, keeping people calm, offering water, little things, caring for people. Then afterwards, when we get there, and then, then the, the Surf Coast Shire, who are currently, immediately as this has started, are already starting things in process. So I'm gonna get um, Pete Ashton from the, the Surf Coast Shire to tell us a little bit, Pete, about what, what's the Shire sort of putting in place ready for when you can get into the community? What, are, what sort of things are happening from the Shire's perspective? So I guess first, um, Jamie, on this particular day, we would be starting to uh, gear up with sort of staff as well. Now, our, our main function on this type of day is to help with sort of that first relief. So you would, you would have seen, um, you know, emergency relief centres set up at some of these fires. So council has that. Function. So we would have already, even before being told by the Incident Control Centre, we've been starting to set one of these places up. Now this year is a little bit different because we've been told by the state government that, you know, they're a last resort option to open up because of the COVID overlay. But we still try and provide that sort of relief um, aspect, potentially in a, um, a modified way or a remote way, so over telephone and internet. So what that happens is usually provide a spot where people can 
um, get some sort of relief. Either they need to, a place to go. Um, often we have families separated, so people are sort of anxious. They want to know what's going on. So it's about providing that sort of information link um, and social support as well. But I would say to people listening uh, today, especially the sort of local people, they sh you really should have a plan that when you leave, you know where you're going, you know where those safe spots are. So in this instance, we'd be setting something up potentially in Torquay. Um, there is a potential in Lawn as well that you mentioned, depending on how this played out. Um, so that's the sort of first aspect that I guess the council also supports the agencies uh, in those sort of peripheral things too. So potentially things like um, just the messaging, potentially helping with road closures and things like that. And then once the incident passes, I guess um, one of this scale, and if there's quite a bit of damage, we'd be sort of teaming up with the state government and, and sort of helping that recovery element. And reco the recovery element really these days is pushed into sort of having that real community ownership of that and how this recovery is going to look um, is really driven a lot by the community. So you'll find that as community leaders that are probably sitting here today will have a, a, a probably a significant role in the recovery as well. Thanks, Pete. So other considerations, decision-making in high-risk high, high risk, uh, environments. Um, uh, and the effects of stress and poor communications, that's, that's a, one of the human factors that's going to o overlay that. Preparedness of the community is really, really important, of the community. And this is sessions like you did with the, um, the lawn, uh, with the, the fire series there. And these, the more information you have and the more discussion that, that's formulated, the better. Uh, the first couple of hours are critical. Um, trust is the, the basic building block of any effective engagement or operations plan. Um, you know, all the agencies in the Shire, they all work as one with it. That's, that's important. And, and the same with, with the community, it's important that we all work as one with these. There's no perfect plan. Um, and I think it's really important that in, 2009, um, in Black Saturday, Arthurs Creek, Strathewan, as you, as you probably know, um, is a little fire brigade, Arthurs Creek, Strathewan, very similar to Aries, um, size, number, number of people. Um, and Strathewan is their satellite brigade. And, and on Black Saturday, of course, as the fire swept through that, um, Strathewan lost 15% of its community were, were killed. Um, they were, they were cut off, of course, with the, you know, it was locked down with the roadblocks um, as crime scenes as it all went through. Um, and at the local fire station, you know, people came, gathered there for information, you know, trying to, for reassurance. And at the fire station were two women, Gail Corr, who's got a house in Aries Inlet, was one of them, and another woman, um, Liesel O'Brien, and one injured firefighter. Now, Arthur's Creek's just off from um, Strathewan a little bit so they could see, see what was going on. And, um, and of course it was horrific. So you can imagine sort of the information coming back and, and these, um, these ladies, how they actually dealt with you know, worried family, um, people in the area trying to find out information. And then they, they for the next six weeks, because of the location of them, they, they fell on the edge of three CFA fire districts. District 14, District 13, and District 12. Now on Black Saturday, they were normally there, they're from District 14, but on the day, they thought it would be best to be managed from District 13 because of the boundary. And of course, when all the, in the aftermath and all the thing that happened afterwards, all the confusion, they fell off the map. So District 13 thought District 13 was looking after them, District 13 sort of forgotten about them. So the brigade and the community sort of just started doing things, looking out for their own. And I, I had a bit to do with the brigade and it was quite amazing when we, when we first met with them a couple of years later, they were so angry. They were so angry at the agencies, just, you know, they'd been let down, they were left on their own. They, you know, they didn't, no one came to help, all that type of stuff. But as we sort of started to work through it, and particularly the efforts of the local community and, and the, the auxiliary 
of the fire brigade, not the firefighters who were busy still mopping up and doing all that sort of thing, but they started to self-organize and started calling for help and support from outside. They, um, they were meeting um, support vehicles of hay and that for stock and, and fuel vehicles. They were directing him in behind their back, through the back rows to get around roadblocks and meeting him at night. They were dressing members of the community who were sort of locked in, who couldn't get out if they, because they couldn't get back in, dressing him in fire gears to take him into Hurstbridge to get provisions. They, for six weeks, they fed people, they got accommodation and caravans, all through cold curling. And at, at the end of the day, they that group of plus women and the local Strathewan community members managed over $750,000 of um, donations, goods, services. Um, and the, as they'll proudly tell you, that they, they reseated every single person and sent them a thank you letter at the end of the day. And it was all done with sticky notes and exercise books. And at the end of the day, they actually came to the conclusion that they were better off actually sorting themselves out. They actually, their recovery, and I remember talking to the captain of the brigade and how do they get through it? You know, we're talking the worst scenario possible. And his comment was, they, we honestly just cared for each other. That was what made the difference. So we're going to go back to the panel, but I just, and I'll conclude, I know this sounds frightening and, um, and how we've painted this up and it, it, it's very, very daunting. Um, but the, the strengths in the community and the more information you have, knowledge is power. So the understanding of fire behavior is really, really important. What's the risk and what's not? Where you are in relation to the fire and the fire start. Thinking and having those discussions with neighbors and family about what you can do. And if you do find yourself in town on those days, and obviously the, the thing is with your trigger points, Hopefully you've gone, you know, you're not there on a day like that. But if you find yourself that you are in town, um, start to understand, well, the road may be blocked. I mightn't get out. Okay, I've already thought through that. This is what I'm going to do. And if you find yourself, once you've got your family safe and your neighbours are okay, and you can actually help the community and step up, step up, um, as I said, because when you think about it, if you go through the people that live in your community, the skills already in town, who coming into town has probably as much skills that you already have, you know, really. Um, agencies will bring support, but you, all, the, all, the, all the skills and talent probably rely in town. Um, and when you look at those 40 or 50 firefighters and the local police that everyone's gonna be in there looking for the, the people to step up and, and help they each through it, um, the recovery is a little bit better. So I'll hand back, I'll stop sharing the screen now and I'll hand back to Charlotte. Um, and uh, I think we're ready for the questions and answers. Hello? Um, yes, yeah, so ready for questions and answers. And Nick, Nick, are you happy to take over from here and do the questions and answers with Birgitta? Yes, yes, I am. Thank you, Charlotte. Great. Okay. Um, we've got a, a key theme that's emerged is um, traffic management. Um, how do we get to the place of last resort? Can we close the Great Ocean Road on green weather days? Um, now, I know Aaron and John have answered a few of those questions via chat, but Aaron, would you mind saying a, a couple of words around um, traffic management on a day like this? Yes, yeah, so look, having been exposed to uh, emergency management fires, both personally and professionally, it's very difficult to describe the extreme mayhem that occurs when these incidents set in. Traffic is not orderly, people panic, and it becomes quite problematic and a large risk for emergency services and the people in those vehicles during an incident like this. So... We, in terms of traffic management, we would be blocking access to the Great Ocean Road back at Geelong 
and we would be doing everything we could with all the available resources to get people out of the area if it was safe to do so. And in this incident, it's probably not. Uh, so in terms of traffic management, uh, we implore people, if they can, to avoid using their cars and to rely on their fire management plans and not to hesitate. Procrastination will lead to a disastrous outcome. Yeah. Can, cool. can I just want to add, Nick, too, just on that, how do we get there? They're the sort of things we, we just can't give you the answer. Um, it, it will be... Um, that's the one you have that discussion, okay? If I can't get my car there, which more than likely you won't, what are my other options? Um, yep. and again, it's a time and space thing. It's information. Um, you know, I know the scenario in Anglesey, people that came to the conclusion that they'll ride their bike down there. Now, look, there's no easy answer because, as Aaron said, it's just so much confusion um, and no order um, for uh, that first couple of hours. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Jamie. Um, so, yeah, I guess as we're hearing there, um, the roads are going to be um, really unmanageable at the personal level pretty quickly. Um, and so if for your own personal planning, if it's something that you can't manage to, say, get on a bike or walk or whatever you might have to do to keep yourself safe, it leads to further planning for yourself um, on those really, really bad risk dates. Um, you might need to be out of town in the morning. At least, at least through the risky part of the day. Uh, Charlotte, you've got and I just like to ask a question about, you know, at, at what time is the Great Ocean Road? Does that get closed, and who makes that decision to actually close off the Great Ocean Road? And you know, and at what point do the does the Great Ocean Road get closed so that it actually stops visitors coming down the Great Ocean Road? And why, why can the road not be closed on an extreme fire danger day to actually stop people coming down anyway? Thanks, Charlotte. I might throw to Dean. Dean Howard, did you want yeah, to... Yeah, there you go, Charlotte. Yeah, I can. So, so thanks, Charlotte, and thank you, everybody, for the opportunity of speaking tonight. So for those um, who don't know me, my name's Dean Howard, and I'm the Regional Emergency Response Coordinator on behalf of Victoria Police. So I control emergency response basically from Geelong to Portland and, and halfway up and working very closely with um, Aaron Reishas, and I certainly support all Aaron's comments tonight. Uh, Shell, it's an interesting question about closing the Great Ocean Road. The fact is that it can't be done. There's, there's so many reasons we can go into in relation to it. But what I can tell you is on days of um, severe fire danger ratings or above, we have emergency preparedness procedures where we have a traffic manager appointed. Um, that will be stood up regardless of whether there's an emergency incident or not. And that person will be planning for all contingencies straight away. In the same fashion, we have an evacuation manager appointed who are both Victoria Police personnel who will be planning and they will be in an incident control uh, centre. In terms of closing the road, at the first sign that they see that it is required um, to prevent uh, for the people entering the area, which will create a hazard, those roads will be closed. So it doesn't have to wait till it's a catastrophic event because it's too late. At the first sign that there's a chance that we may need to close that Glorison Road, as Aaron said, we'd most likely close it at Geelong, but certainly close it out the back of Torquay beforehand to let uh, more traffic come in. But one of the big things uh, I think is really, really important is trusting the decisions of your emergency responders. They are experts. They are making decisions based on fact and intelligence. And they overall, above everything else, they have the best interests of the community at heart. And that is why they are there, to try and protect their community. And sometimes you may not always understand their decisions, but you do need to follow their decisions. Something else that's been a little bit of a theme, if I can touch on a couple of things, Nick, if that's okay, that I've been yeah. listening to tonight. And it's been fantastic yeah. from all the presenters, so thank you. Um, Peter Ashton spoke about um, having a great plan, and I think that's planning is so important in any event, but just as important as the planning is practising your planning prior to any event to ensure that you can get in contact with those lovers, to ensure that your plan actually does work. And on top of that, in the event of an emergency, is actually following your plan which is one of the hardest things to do. It's when people say, oh, do I really need to start now? If you're asking that question, 
you need to start following your plan and you need to take that immediate action. In terms of information, and we, and we touched on information and, and, and social media before, and um, I think it's really important that the information you get is accurate. And social media, I think your, your information would be um, about as reliable as a Donald Trump tweet. And I don't think I'd be focusing and trusting too much in that personally. People might have a bit different opinion on that. But there are places where you can get really reliable and accurate information. The Vic Roads website will always tell you traffic conditions and in, 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 is updated regularly and is a great place to look. Um, there's a, an iWatch place for Victoria Police. We can tell you any information that is put on that will be accurate. CFA websites, emergency work services website, the Emergency Management Victoria websites, they're trusted sources of information. And in the event communications go down, we have communications plans to get people at, um, information out through TV and local radio. So whilst sometimes it may be stressful, um, it would be the most extreme of circumstances where you would be left in the dark. There would be some level of communication getting out to the community. Thanks, Nick. Great, thanks, Dean. Thank you. Okay, um, we've had a few other questions about the place of last resort, um, such as how many people can be there, what would it look like on the day, can we bring our dogs? Um, I, in lieu of anyone else throwing up their hand, I might um, volunteer you, Ross Gervin, for this one. You can just about see it from your place. Um, and yeah, you'll, um, you'll most likely be in town on the day. Yeah, look, uh, the the issue we've got with the, the place of last resort, and just for those that uh, um, are still unsure where they're located, so uh, basically in front of the shops, in in front of uh, Strapper Surf Shop, which is uh, the Bitumen Car Park, and and now across um, in front of the fire station site along the Nature Strip between Bam Bamber Road and um, and and the and the golf club or the golf centre, if you like. Uh, the view is to have the um, fire station site on the Great Ocean Road um, to, to be a um, neighbourhood safer place. And, and that's uh, being worked through with CFA and Council. Um, but as we know that on these sorts of days, uh, most of those car parks will fill up very, very quickly. So it's going to be um, very difficult to to, um, to to find a a car park, um, and to have animals and that there. Um, of course, people are going to have have their pets and and that. So um, you know, it, there's no restriction there, but it's um, but it's it's a matter of uh, trying to find space. Um, ideally, we're we're trying to. Um, uh, you know, have have the the fire station site. Um, it, it probably won't get over the line for for this summer, but unofficially, uh, the grass will be cut, kept kept neat, and there's no reason why the site can't be used to park cars on 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 the site to to get us as an uh, as an overflow, so to speak, for this summer. Great, great. Thanks, uh, thanks for that, Ross. Nick, could I just add a little bit just on that one too? Um, yeah, that that will fill up where that. So it'll be not the greatest places, but you know places like the beach. You know, like this is trying to get through. It will be packed and full, and not the there will be places that uh, these low fuel areas and stuff that. Um, maybe it, it is. So have a have a bit of a think about it. You know, if it is going to be full, what's you know, you get down to the neighborhood safer place and there's no and there's no space there. Well, what's your next plan? Um, this is what we're doing is the the whole idea with this thinking is get your plan A, B, C, D, E, F, if this happens. And the studies have shown from a decision making point of view, running through the different what if scenarios, if I get that, the, the, the mere fact of going through that, um speeds up your decision making, we're actually confronted with it because you've already done some pre-thinking about it. And so when you're confronted with it, you'll quickly speed up your decision making. So they're the discussions to have with your family and yourself. Okay, we're going to go down the night. What if we can't get there? Well, why don't we do this? Okay, what if that, and just tease that out until, uh, and those discussions be so, so important. 
Jamie, can I just leap in there? Yep. Uh, just going back to the very first point that uh, I made about the, how dispersed the population of Aries is. Yes. Uh, and the fact that we have that one very central, important, uh, safe place. Uh, it just highlights the importance of what you were saying earlier about the need to plan for people, say, who are living in Fairhaven or up uh, around the top shops, for them to think, um, you know, if we can't readily get down to the bottom shops in that safe place uh, on the car park there, you know, what is the next best thing to do? Yes. Uh, and and I, just one coming through about the, with the visitors add to your plans. Well, at that point in time, um, they're all part of our community. <laughs> So I know that there's probably, we mightn't want them to be part of the community at that point in time, but they are. Um, so, you know, they're going to be, they're going to cause things. So maybe it's some direction, leave your car here, mate, and head down here, go to the, you know, whatever it may be. But this is the thinking before the event. And, and there's no correct answer. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Jamie. Um, it's, it's one of those things people sitting in traffic always complain about the traffic, but they are the traffic. Um, yes, there's a lot of people in Aries, um, but it's why wouldn't you be? It's a beautiful part of the world. Um, and it's just one of those extra factors that we have to, we have to deal with. Um, so water supplies and property protection is another um, theme, questions that has emerged. Um, can I, uh, maybe I'll ask Wayne Elmer to respond to property protection. Thanks, Nick. Sorry, I'll just type in an answer to another question. So just, um, can I have that question again? Was it about property protection? Yeah, so, um, I guess questions around property protection, um, either from brigades and, um, the emergency services or, um, being able to defend it yourself, um, and what might water supplies in town look like? Yeah, okay. so so generally water supply becomes an issue in a town once you have a fire, because obviously brigades start using water, but everybody starts you know filling their gutters and doing bits and pieces around the house. Um, the water supply should be reliable and should stay on. It might be a big statement, but that's the reality. Of what we're being told that we should maintain water supply in these towns in, in, in that type of environment. Um, in terms of, there's probably two parts to that question in what are you doing to protect your home? Now, now some people have the physical capability of being able to do that and that might be part of their fire plan. Others, their fire plan may be to leave and any of that preparation work would need to be done prior to those type of days. Uh, and in terms of the fire service, I think once we have an event like that, and we realise that first attack on the fire ground is not going to work, that, you know, we would be pulling resources back into town to do um, what we would call asset protection. So with the aim of, um, you know, trying to save as many properties as we can, and that would be reasonably strategic. So there is some work that's done in the background there that, um, you know, we have some ideas about where we could... Uh, get the best bang for our buck to find a term, I suppose, where we're going to get the more benefit from the resources that we put in town. I hope that answers the question, Nick. Yep, great. Thanks, uh, thanks for that, Wayne. No drama. Okay, um, there was a question around how many uh, severe, extreme fire danger days and severe fire danger days there's been in Aries in the last season. Um, Pete Ashton, um, you're a, I wouldn't say weather nerd, but um, this is uh, right up your alley, I reckon. I know how to take that, uh, <laughs> Nick. Um, so on, on average, we get about um, five severe days a year and we get one extreme day a year. And if you look at the stats, we have about one code red day every five years. Now, having said that, we haven't had one specifically since 2009. Although I think it was um, the day before New Year's Eve, the weather station in Aries did go over 100 FDI. So that's putting it into the uh, code red category. So these days don't happen that often. I will say they have predicted with, with the changing climate in the next few decades that we're talking about uh, another nine days, um, sort of in the top half of very high and above. 
So it is it is a risk that's increasing. But I would say these days don't come along that often. You need to know when they do occur and that needs to be an important part of your plan is what particular fire day you're looking at. Um, and so, it, yeah, I think it's just part of the responsibility of kind of living in this part of the world that you understand that. Thanks, Pete. Um, for uh, weather nerds, maybe yeah, a little bit uh, harsh, but maybe passionate weather observer. Um, another question that's come through, is the uh, pub a safe refuge? Um, who would like to actually, Bo, can I get you to answer that one? Um, because there's a follow-up question for you as well. Um, what do the strategic fuel breaks that have recently uh, been implemented, the test sites, what do they do for our community? Sure, thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, look, uh, <clears throat> I'm certainly not the authority on neighbourhood safer places. Um, that's certainly a, a, a Shire and, and CFA sort of focus, but um, but it's it's it hasn't met the the standards to be classified as a neighbourhood safer place. That's my understanding. Um, and there are some really clear and strict criteria for that. Um, however, uh, there's a big gravel car park there. And um, it's probably in the, the category of a, a footy oval. Um, it's, it's not the worst place to be on a bad bushfire day. So, I, and, and I think that's what Jamie was really encouraging people to do earlier was to think about what are those other places? Um, because if the neighborhood safer place is full or you cannot get there, or you need to guide someone else to, to somewhere that it's least you know, safer, then, then maybe that's um, something that you can talk about as a, as a community. Um, the, the question around the strategic fuel breaks um, was from someone called Chris. Thanks very much for the question. Um, we, we've actually just kicked off uh, a really big program with three demonstration strategic fuel breaks, um, one in Anglesey, in Vlocky Street, uh, the one in Aries Inlets on Boundary Road, um, so sort of up near Sunnymead there, um, and, and then we've also done one in Lawn. And really these fulfill a couple of different outcomes depending on where they sit in the landscape but uh, but all these demonstration ones are hard up against town and and really the the objective for them is to where um where possible enable our planned burning so we're reducing fuels hard up against the town boundary for 40 meters um, so retaining the, the tall healthy trees but removing all the understory um, but we're also meaning it's meaning that we can deliver planned burns uh, more confidently and more regularly right up hard against town, which then reduces the fuels stepping out into the landscape. And I suppose that's um, from forest fire management Victoria's perspective, that's really our, our focus is dealing with that landscape scale risk. Um, we, we, we have a, a support role when we come into town, but, but that's, our, that's our focus. So for us, being able to sort of really harden up the town boundaries and then work back outwards and, and reduce the I suppose in this scenario, to, to see where that fire started, um, I would I'd really love to see in that scenario that, that that actually ran into one of our planned burns and it slowed down um, and maybe it didn't spot as far. So it didn't get to town as quickly, which meant that more people could seek refuge or get out of town or at least sort of come up with a reasonable plan. Um, they're, they're the sorts of things that, that forest fire management do. Um, if I can take the opportunity, I, I think just to add to, to what Aaron Ledden was touching on before, well, on the day of the fire, before the fire's kicked off, um, and, and this is kind of just, a, I know this is a bit, this whole session's probably been a bit daunting for some people, so I just want to um, maybe just uh, reinforce that uh, as agencies, we're, we're well connected and, and we are well resourced. Um, uh, so I suppose on the morning of, we would also put up fire tower observers um, at Peters Hill, just behind Aries, and one just behind Lawn at Mount Cowley. Um, we've got aircraft that as soon as a fire is reported out of Colac, it's a helitac, so it's a, it's a large water bombing helicopter. Uh, it, instantly it, it, it instantly responds. So within 15 minutes, it is in the air and it is going. Um, no matter if we know where the fire is or not, it's just overhead and it's starting to water bomb if it deems it safe to do so. Um, We've also got some really large air tankers. So they're the really, really big um, kind of jumbo jet cock type um, planes that um, are based out of Avalon Airport. Uh, and again, they're amazing, uh, like huge capacity to, to drop um, water or fire retardant. So um, 
yeah, so I think as a, as a collective, um, there are a lot of resources at our disposal and that stuff will happen. But again, that's going to be really scary as an individual that thinks that maybe you'll lose your house and you're scared for your life. Um, having massive aeroplanes flying over you, dropping water nearby is going to be just um, horrifying. So I think just knowing that that stuff will happen hopefully helps. Um, and Nick, maybe the final thing that I'd love to say is just that um, Aries Inlet, Angle C, Lawn, you are lucky communities. Um, uh, I've worked across Victoria and I'm really happy to say that the agencies here genuinely uh, are connected and genuinely are planning to respond together. There was a, there was a comment that said sort of, what's your plan? And um, uh, as agencies, I suppose, and I'm really comfortable to say that, you know, there's so much more we could do. There always will be um, because of the bushfire risk, but uh, we work so closely with, with the Shire and with CFA uh, and with Vic Pole and all of our other emergency responders. And, uh, and most of us live in these communities. So we're also, you know, connected in as community members. So um, yeah, thanks, Nick. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks, Bo, fantastic. Um, Pete Ashton, I'll throw to you around answering um, a Bell 29 house. So what does, what does that look like and what does that do? I should just explain that, so the bell system is part of the building code and there's bell 12 and a half, 19, 29, 40. Now, that, that number is about theoretically how much radiant heat that house can um, withstand. So it's saying it can withstand 29 kilowatts. So just to give you uh, an example of how hot that is, a human can survive about 20 seconds outside at five kilowatts. So it's pretty hot. So... If you'd done all the right things in your house, it, it, it's probably survivable. But often what we do is we build a Bell 29 house or, or, or the like, and, and that was designed to fend off radiant heat. But if we then go and put parked cars next to it and boats and caravans and have vegetation up against our house, it, you now need, and, and you've got direct flame on that house, it, it's not, it was never built for that. You actually need a flame zone house. So... Under some circumstances, it would be. If you're going to seek shelter in a house and, and you're planning to do that, you need to get a bit of advice and understand it. As a last minute thing, I'd much rather be in a Bell 29 house than one that wasn't built to any standard. Um, so there's lots of nuances, you know, I, I guess, and, um, and there's lots of information uh, on the CFA website. We can give information to people if they want to understand the risk of their houses and things they can do to improve its safety. Um, so it is a pretty difficult question to answer in, in one line, but there's definitely help, help out there if you want to know more about your house and making it more defendable. Excellent, thanks, Pete. Okay. Um, there's, a, there's a question there around, is there um, a contact or a person that we can discuss our individual fire plans with? Um, this person has a business in town, so they have a, some additional considerations. Um, the answer is yes, that would be me. Um, myself or Brigida Hutchins from, uh, from DELP. Um, and my, um, my details are available through the Shire. So call or email into the Shire um, and I can help you work through plans um, and or put you in touch with CFA um, people, experts in that space as well. Um, see if they have teams of people who um, do great work around that. Okay, um, another, another question here is, if our planning um, is to leave on an extreme um, or a worrying day, why should tourists be encouraged to come to areas on those days by keeping the Great Ocean Road open? Would Melbourne News on TV and radio give warnings the evening before and early morning offer warnings of the high risk of, for visitors visiting high risk areas to reconsider their travel? Um, look, because it's um, to do with traffic um, there, I might throw to um, Aaron from Vicpol. Um, I will say though that um, there was there was last last summer. Um, just before New Year's, quite a quite an awful fire day. Um, and I believe the Premier was on TV saying, reconsider your need to travel into these areas. We're not closing the roads, but we strongly encourage you not to be 
in those places. Yeah, hi Nick, thanks for the question. So yes, that would be uh, some part of the messaging, but we're very mindful that it needs to be a single source of messaging. So through the Vic Emergency app, our people would be talking to them and putting out those warnings. The VMS signage on highways uh, would be signaling that and we would be advocating to avoid the area at all costs. So that's certainly part of the planning and restricting access to the area. Thank you, Aaron. Okay, I think um, I think we might be pretty close as far as the question and answers go. There, um, I know some people have had direct um, answers typed to them. Um, I'll, I'll, go, I'll be going through all these questions afterwards as well, um, just making sure that we absolutely have covered off on things um, and I'll attempt to get in touch um, through your Eventbrite registration, um, if, uh, if that's the case. Um, just finally though, before we wrap up, Jamie McKenzie, would you, um, did you have something, did you want to wrap up? You have something to yeah. say? Yeah, thanks, Nick. Yeah, I'll, um, look, I just, um, Thank everybody. Look, and I know it's really daunting and there's so many unanswered questions, but unfortunately, um, there's so many variables to do with the bushfire there's just, and human behaviour. There's just so many variables. And I know it'd be nice to have a nice checklist, but it just, it, it, there isn't one. Um, there's some guidelines and principles, which we're hopefully tonight's given you some. Um, and it's really important to, to, to really look at the things that you can control, not, not get caught up in the things you can't control. Uh, you know your property how you prepare the property all the little things you know that and the, as as Bo mentioned now the agencies work really close together and it's really important that work closely with the community as well I probably just um, just want to really really that um, we it's all about just getting your plans um, and and being really I know it's we've been harping on about it um, but Emotion overrides rational thought. Um, so under the under the pressure and stress of an event like this, um, your decision making will, will typically be collapsed. So there's some really good tips, you know, um, to think about for yourselves. You know, is to reduce the stress, um, take, slow things down a little bit. It, it's not going to be on you in five minutes. So take it, take a deep breath, slow it down, slow your decision making down and, and do a, have more considered. You, you will have more time than you think to make your decisions. It's not going to be where you're just going to rush and jump into your car and go. It won't be, you'll have some bit of time. And even if it, five minutes of thinking time um, is a long time to really work through a situation, bounce off ideas. Uh, it's those things with your neighbours, to have those discussions with your neighbours. What are their plans? What are you going to do? Um, um, you know, there's a group at, at Point Road night, they set up, they end up with 80 of them. They got a, a little WhatsApp group going, so they just let each other know who's not going to be around on certain days and things like that. So there's lots of solutions. As I said, um, think of that um, vending machine. Just bounce ideas and, and come out. Uh, and I'm sure you'll come up with some really good ideas. An example of your plan A, B and C, the Scottsburn fire. There was a woman on a big property there. The fire was on their property. Um, so the husband it was a farm. So the husband and the the work hand went off to fight the fire. So the the, the wife was at home. Um, the woman was at home with her granddaughter. Um, it went. The sky went dark. She had no communications with her husband. She could hear aircraft going. She brought the working dogs into the house. And she was a member of the fire brigade as well. She brought the, the, the working dogs in the house and they proceeded to pee on all the furniture to mark their territory. And the house dog ended up eating something and getting um, food uh, poisoning and, and started vomiting. Meanwhile, she was trying to, to calm the daughter, stop the dogs peeing on the furniture, the other one spewing. And she said to me, I had plan A, B, I got down to plan Z. Everything just kept changing. So... Just work through some of those. And I'm sure with your families and your neighbours um, and the relationships within the community and to the age and the agencies, 
I'm sure that you'll you'll improve your planning. And when it does happen, if something does happen, and hopefully it won't, that the fact that you've gone through the thinking um, puts you in a much better place and your decisions will be better and faster. So thank you for tonight. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Jamie. Fantastic. Um, yeah, it just really illustrates the, the title of this evening's session is, is um, spot on. What if? So you just keep asking yourself, what if? What if? What if? Run through your planning. Um, I will, um, I'll ask uh, Charlotte to wrap up now. Um, but I will, myself and Begita Hutchins, um, we'll make our email addresses available um, after this session, either via Ada's website or we'll, we'll, we'll get a link out to you. Um, we'll also send some, um, oh, thanks, uh, thanks, Zach. We'll also send some follow up um, where you can seek further information. Um, and then, yeah, so if you've got any further questions after this, um, please do get in touch and we'll make sure you have our contact details for that. I think um, that's it for me, Charlotte. Okay. Thanks very much, Nick. And I'd also like to say thanks to Jamie, to Ross, Bowden, Aaron, Wayne, Peter, Dean, and also to you, Nick. Um, it's just been fantastic. I think tonight's session has been... Um, it's really highlighted the sort of the uncertainties and unpredictabilities of bushfire and um, what we all face in terms of if, if there was one. And I know that there will be a lot of people who will be certainly thinking about their bushfire plan and recognising the need to have a good one. Um, and there'll also be a lot of people who will now be planning to leave and to leave early when conditions indicate there's a high fire danger. I think you've given the community a lot to think about in relation to locally led response, community self-reliance and our need for preparedness. We really appreciate you sharing your time and expertise with us. And I would also like to thank fellow Ada committee member, Suzanne Kavanagh for her help, Perry Gaylard for preparing our promotional material and Zach Cooper Traffers for his technical support. I think we've had an evening very well spent. And so thank you to everybody and thank you to everybody who's come to those Ada members and also to the all those people who in fact aren't Ada members. But I'd also just like to say, please join Ada um, to help us protect what we really love about this part of the coast. So thank you, everybody. It's been a terrific evening. So well done. Jamie, thanks. Thank you, Charlotte.